Hello, good evening and welcome to this very special edition of Good Evening Ghana. Tonight we are having a conversation. We're going to have a conversation that you cannot miss. We are talking to one of Ghana's most influential women, but one of the most quiet women uh, in Ghana. Phyllis Maya Christian just turned 60 recently, uh, but she could pass for 35. She has um, a lot in her bag and she has a lot to tell us. She began her career... Um, academic life from Holy Child School and the University of Ghana. She qualified as a lawyer in Ghana, uh, worked uh, as a practicing lawyer for a little bit, went abroad as many of the people of her generation, stayed in Boston, which she still loves very much, and uh, returned to Ghana straight to work, work for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, after that, um, she continued working for them and other consulting firms until she founded Shaw Bell Consulting 14 years ago. Shobel has made such a significant difference in the way in which things are done in Ghana. They have trained many, many people in corporates. They have given flagship programs to many corporate industries that we'll be talking about, not least of them, the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, the GMPC, the Forestry Commission, the Procurement Authority. They've done a lot. So tonight we'll be talking to her about many things, about Ghana, about our democracy, about our future, about our corporate life, and about our education. So tell your friend to tell his friend that one of the most influential women in Ghana is on Good Evening Ghana tonight. I'll be back. Thank you very much, uh, PMC, as they call you. Thank you. Congratulations on your 14th anniversary with Shobel Thank you. and on your 60th uh, anniversary as well. <laughs> so how has Ghana changed since you became an adult? Maybe 40 years. <laughs> I think Ghana has changed in many ways. Um, um, for one thing, there's a lot more going on in terms of um, the media and um, social um, media and um, the internet, etc. I mean, we could only dream of that, you know, 40 years ago. Um, we used to play records with LPs. Now you don't even play CDs anymore. Everything is downloaded. Um, but moving to more serious things, we find that... Um, the industry in terms of professional services has changed tremendously. I mean, those days, um, people were doing what they were trained to do in terms of um, legal work, engineers, etc. And perhaps, to a large extent, there was more focus on the professional services. These days, you find all manner of um, um, trades which are very um, supportive to the um, um, economy and are not necessarily in the formal sector as well. So you, you find, for instance, that football players are making a lot more money than they did in those days. And um, so parents are more willing to see their children going to soccer academies than they were in the past. I mean, in the past, if you said you wanted to play soccer as a profession, you, you, you know, your parents will probably lock you up and, and, and insist that you study, you know. So to that extent, a lot has changed for good and for bad, as well as um, the fact that um, I find in my professional life that educationally we're not doing as well. Um, in those days, you could guarantee that if somebody came out with a second upper or first class, then you're talking about somebody you can rely on completely for everything, not only in terms of what they know, but even in the uh, kind of reports they can write and um, the way they communicate, etc. These days, especially in my business, you find that people are, you know, are still getting the first classes and everything. But once they join us, we find that even the critical thinking capacity is not as strong as it could be. And you wonder what went wrong. Um, perhaps it's not what went wrong. Perhaps it's more to do with what we could be doing more because there are more people going into university and all that. So perhaps it's a way of thinking as to how we can find ways of enhancing, you know, the kind of um, expertise that people are coming out with from school. Uh, to that extent, a lot has changed as well, yes. I see, that's, that's interesting. How has the international community also changed? Um, because you lived in Ghana, and mm -hmm. you traveled abroad. Okay. Um, how is the connection, you know, the, we and the international community, mm -hmm. how has it changed? Well, I find that um, the international community is more interested in what we're doing development-wise. Um, at the same time, um, I find also, in those days, for instance, we're able to travel everywhere without visas. 
without visa. Visas, yes, yes. We were able to go to the UK without a visa. You were only interviewed at the airport and in, they would let you in. I mean, my current office actually was the British High Commission in those days. And sometimes you would be allowed to just go without the visa. <laughs> it was that simple. However, a lot has changed as a result. And um, um, they're also spending more money on the development process for us, which was not the case before. And that in, indirectly also gave rise to a lot of consultants because there were a lot of projects that required um, consultants to support in terms of um, um, institutional enhancement and um, building up of the economy, etc. And so I, we got involved in consulting as a result of that, which didn't used to be the case before because we're probably more self-sufficient. Um, I have to say that, um, you know, the, some depression in the economy gave rise to the coups, etc. in the past. And so, um, but when things started to revive, we found that there was more interest on the part of the development partners and the international bodies to try and support that growth, um, for good or bad. <laughs> so, um, yes, so that, so that relationship changed, where it was more um, related to development than uh, simply for them to come and invest in here, for example. Okay. Back to that story, but let's talk about you. So you are a lawyer. Yes, I am. And um, what we understand about lawyers historically and traditionally mm -hmm. is that they go to court for a client and work for a client. That mm -hmm. has changed a little bit, even mm -hmm. in my generation, where okay. lawyers are doing what more the English people call solicitors. Yes. But yours is completely different. Mm -hmm. So you are a lawyer. You, mm -hmm. you run Shawbell. Yes. You'll come to the the mystery of the name. Okay. So an interesting name, <laughs> Shawbell Consulting. Uh, do you render legal services? Yes. We do. But you call it consulting? No. Um, our work in terms of the work we do, see, if I may say a bit about Shobel Consulting, we are, an, um, we are three firms, actually. Oh, we, are, we are management consultants where we do institutional reform, operational uh, restructuring, etc., for, for public and private organizations. And then we have the law firm, which is Shobel Consulting Lex which provides only legal services to clients, investors, for example, who want to invest in the oil and gas industry, for one, and other areas, of course. Currently, it's the oil and gas industry. That's why I'm just bringing them up. And then we have the Ghana Institute of Consulting, which trains consultants. So the firm is a hybrid of three things, which I found over the years to be a critical blend um, based on some of the things that um, we were doing um, across board. I felt that it was important, uh, aside from the fact that I wanted to continue doing corporate law, because that's what my, my interest is. You know, that's where my interest basically lies in corporate law. Um, I decided that um, because I had also worked with Pricewaterhouse in, in, in the early 90s, I found that it was a, a great blend to be able to do both. Uh, because so many things were crisscrossing with each other in a positive way that I could see that the legal services were useful for the um, consulting services and some aspects of the consulting work were very useful for the legal services we provided to our investors. So, yes, very focused on corporate law. So you have worked uh, in Pricewaterhouse, you've sat on public boards, Yes. Uh, Ghana Water Company, etc. Yes. Uh, and, and now you have Many to... years ago. <laughs> and you've done Shadow for 14 years. Yes. If you were to be asked, is a public sector working? What would you say? Hmm. The, the idea is to help them work. I mean, I find that it's the private sector working. Even the private sector <laughs> is also guilty of its own um, uh, uh, drawbacks. Um, the public sector will work if we support them to work, but they must also understand that they need support because if it's like engaging someone to come and work with you. It's very unlikely that anybody can come in and fit right there and you know go with you, go with us. That we don't have our best people in the public sector. I wouldn't say that because in my interactions with them, I have found, especially at the Ministry of Finance, that people are extremely qualified. Um, Perhaps some people have fallen through the cracks in terms of, I mean, we, we hear stories about people, you know, engaging their relatives, etc. But I have found 
that the people we have come across are genuinely competent in the work they do. They just need help. That's what I found. People will rather work at Shawbell than, than work at the Ministry of Trade or, or Attorney General's Department. Well, I wonder. I think that um, because, let me, let me tell you, the civil service is very big on training. The civil service, the public service, will, will take advantage of training opportunities, both in Ghana and abroad, to send their staff for training. So anybody who conceives of the idea that the private sector, look, private sector can't even afford as much training as the public sector does, frankly. I mean, very few of us are capable and willing to send your staff abroad for training. And what I find is that the public service does that. And I think it's a misnomer if you think that um, uh, people would prefer to be in the private sector. Of course they would. I mean, because they have this impression that the private sector pays better. Okay. But the public, in the end, you, you get more value from the public sector as far as I'm concerned. And that's what I, I, I advise young people all the time. Because one, they train you. There's a... Um, there's a, what do you call it, there's a growth, uh, um, a clear growth you know, um, a pattern that you can become part of if, if your career goals are to stay within the public service. And there are mentors who can assist. Occasionally, of course, the politics of the day might bring in people who are only there for the, 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 the political, um, what do you call it, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, but um, I think by and large, young people, if they knew more about what the public service has to offer, would be more interested in going into the public sector than even the private. And you'd be surprised that some people do understand that the public sector offers more opportunity. And aside from everything, we have a lot of young people who want to make change. I have found that a lot of young people just want to be trained to grow and to impact society, really. So I'm not sure that that's truly the fact. P private sector, yes, but you know what? I'll be more private suspicious. Mm -hmm. Institutions that are coming up quite nicely. You mentioned Ministry of Finance. Yes. That has been put on a scale since the early 90s. And yes. It's, it's developing and looking like um, best practices, high standards. Yes. Then the GMPC uh, mm -hmm. also looks quite good. Mm -hmm. In the oil sector, uh, Tamil Refinery, the bulk oil storage and mm -hmm. transport, Petroleum Commission recently, all of them looking like yes, yes. institutions. But, but there's a huge chunk of Ministry of Local Government, District Assemblies, that, that really will not be attractive to. Yes, the because people don't want to, I mean, the word rural, <laughs> you know, the term local uh, government makes you think you're going to be sent to um, a rural area where there's not going to be any water. So and people don't the want that. There are the AMAs where a lot could be done, but... But the, the, but the problem is that we're hearing all the bad things about AMA. Of course people won't want to go there. The thing is that you people in the press also have a role to play. Well, you go there, uh, where you go there and ascertain what it is that they're doing that is good. And in that way, you're getting people who are, more in, who are qualified for one thing and interested in being a part of that. And so I think maybe on both sides, their side and your side as well, you should be working towards getting them um, to get a better name than they're getting because from where I sit all I hear is the fact that AMA is is you know charging the wrong um, tariffs for this that and the other and they're compelling people to move from the main roads and all that and they shouldn't be doing that and you know getting people to clean you know on weekends when they shouldn't you know it's it's not com it shouldn't be compulsory it's all that and it really gives those public agencies a bad name. We're coming to talk to you, our research indicated that you have Shobel has very high marks with GMPC people. What, okay, what did you do <laughs> I don't that? know, but I wish. Um, we did um, some training and, you know, we have an institute, the Ghana Institute of Consulting, and how we approach training at the institute is to ensure that we are not, I mean, the reason why we have an institute as opposed to just a general training institute, we have an institute of consulting, is because we want to train people um, the way consultants would work, for example, because there's a major aspect of consulting which involves critical thinking and being sensitive to the, um, the, the mandates, for example, of the institute you're working with and what they're really supposed to be doing. Okay, and so 
when we are asked to train organizations, what we're looking at is whether or not the people in there understand those mandates, what, what exactly they're supposed to be doing, and best practices in other countries as to how they have made it work, you see. And so we took the training from that perspective. It's called the Junior Executive Professional Program. And what we do is that we come and live with you in a way. We understand GNPC, we know what you're going through, we know where you want to go in terms of your vision, etc. We become very um, familiar with your law and your operations, etc. And then we teach about performance within that sort of habitat, within that context, and within the larger global context as well. Because mind you, a lot of them are sent on attachments with, with um, international companies and they must come back to the same GMPC they left behind. The idea is for them to come back feeling that we can make a big difference to the organization we are in as well, as opposed to coming back and coming to see the same old things and not being able to grow in terms of your global perspectives. So we, we teach them to appreciate that and to, to feel very proud of where they are. Um, but only from a consultant's perspective. I mean, if you came to us and said you wanted leadership training, we're going to tr train you in leadership, but from a pers uh, the perspective of a consultant, not from just an ordinary leader. You don't take political leadership? Um, even politicians should understand how they should do their work, you know, from the consulting <laughs> perspective, you know. And, and that means, you know, first of all, being talented at what you do, there's no point in being put in a position if you just don't have the knack for it. Okay, so you have to be talented at what you do. You have to, it's, it's an arsenal of gifts or it's an arsenal of qualifications that you must have to be a consultant. And so you have talent, you have knowledge of best practices, you have experience, you have exposure, you have diligence. I mean, you can't do the work if you're not diligent. If you're going to go home at five, then nothing is going to change because time is money and um, it's all those things together so if a politician a political leader can't doesn't have all that then they need an army of people to help them okay and I understand um, the need to have um, political strength in various sectors etc but it's very important that they also have the right people to support them because this blend is what makes things work I have two questions for you for young people so mm -hmm. The first one is a young person who's qualified out of school and I have mm -hmm. a friend who is a, a medical practitioner mm -hmm. and um, uh, she's qualified out of school working as a doctor. Uh, she feels that she became a doctor only because her family wanted to, her to be a doctor. Okay. She thinks that she has talent in other areas mm -hmm. uh, but she's stuck with medicine. What would you tell such a person? And there are a few of them like that who grew up in a family where you have to become a lawyer, mm -hmm. you have to become a doctor. And we don't seem to understand in this country that you can study law mm -hmm. and be a movie maker. Mm -hmm. You can study medicine and be a radio presenter. Mm -hmm. You don't have that kind of system in Ghana. Okay. So how does somebody like that connect herself, himself to corporate? Well, I think the person is very lucky, first of all, to be a, a doctor. Because um, you're far away, you know, from a, where a lot of people are right now. <laughs> But that doesn't mean you can be pigeonholed or you should be pigeonholed into where you've been placed if, if you want to say that's, it's their parents' desire. I was one of them. I mean, my father was a lawyer, my grandfather was a lawyer, his father was a lawyer. I'm, I'm, what is it, third or fourth, fourth generation lawyer. But I'm doing law and consulting and I also have a training institute. But when you were 35, how did you deal with that situation? Oh, it was not easy because my mother always said, look, I don't understand you. You know, she never understood that. Um, why I wanted to go into consulting when your father was a judge, you should be in court and everything. Yes, it was very nice walking through the high court here and people said, oh, you're Howard Christian's daughter. We rec oh, yeah, you walk like him and all that. It's nice. But really, I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. I wanted to be a consultant. And I was lucky that I had those breaks. Was it all because we're not making money from, from practicing law? Um... You're talking about what you saw at the party. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, um, was it that? No. No. First, I looked at my strengths. I mean, I, as you said, I, I went to Holy Child and I studied Latin to sixth form. I did my A level in Latin. And I found that I enjoyed the, the art of writing. I enjoyed 
the art of you know deductive reasoning and everything in logic and and then when i went to university i did philosophy and for me there's something to be said for being able to look at a situation and figure out what the the resolution is i mean the problem is I, um yes um, there's something about advocacy going into court and the trial um, and process and everything that was also interesting but i also felt that my strength lay more in where I ended up. And by a, a series of circumstances, I did end up where I am today. And frankly, I don't regret it. I do, I am, interest, I'm, I am still interested in trial law. And I, I'd like to be able to, to, to um, perhaps contribute to best practices in that area as well. I mean, I have done a lot of work for the judicial service. And uh, we've, we've even looked at traditional uh, dispute resolution and how somehow that can be mainstreamed as well into um, the, the regular courts, etc. Okay, there's a divide, so it's not so easy. However, those are the things that continue to interest me. So I can be part of it without necessarily being there, you know. And I think that experience that I've gained is more useful to me now than if I was simply a, a trial lawyer. That's Phyllis Maya Christian. I'm sure that you are already getting uh, into her way of thinking. Very interesting personality, one of the most influential women in Ghana. After the break, we'll continue with the conversation. We'll talk about education, we'll talk about more about consulting, we'll talk more about Shovel. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you very much for your time. We have quite a bit to talk about, and uh, we'll also talk about entertainment. Never mind, it's going to come. It's a big part of our conversation. Let's talk about the petroleum sector. Mm. So we heard that we discovered oil and Ghana is doing 100,000 barrels, not quite a day. But when we were younger, we had Nigeria that's 2 million barrels, mm -hmm. Angola that's 2 million barrels, Libya. Do we have a significant petroleum sector? Well, should, we, should we stop concentrating on No, I don't think we should concentrate on the oil sector you know, exclusively. No, I believe that we should... Um, pay equal attention, if not more, to cocoa, etc., because those areas have carried us to this day. But for me, 100 versus 2 million barrels, look, I'm quite excited because I never thought that this day will ever come. Those years, you, you, you were young, I mean, <laughs> we always wondered whether or not the oil um, find would ever happen. For us, it was just a dream. It was, there was no way even when we were told, um, I think um, um, the GMPC went to the, cast, uh, the castle in those days to show um, ex-president Kufua a little vial of oil and oil. I still didn't believe it because it was so long in coming. So for now, I'm really excited that we, we, we have the beginnings of a, an, an industry that could really take us far. Um, so I don't think we should lose hope with respect to the industry. I think there's a lot happening. Ghana has laid the groundwork. They've, they've done the groundwork. They've laid the foundation for the industry. They have a commission now. GMPC is gearing up. Um, and I think we have a petroleum revenue management law, which has just recently been revised. So we're quite excited about, it can only get better. That's all I can say. So yes. you, you see a great future in the petroleum Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, it, it has changed the face of this country. And I think it will continue to do so uh, for years to come. As long as we manage the, the resource properly, we, we ensure that our controls are in place. And then we have the right lawyers and statesmen to defend what we have. Yes, yes, I, I think we have a lot of it. The boundary commission, um, the boundary issue is, 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 is a, a bit of a, a setback, but we hope that it won't be a major setback and, and we can proceed, you know. Let's come back to the youth and to education. And there's a big debate that's been going on for the last 10 years or so about <laughs> the nature of courses people study at university. Mm -hmm. The nexus between that and one's ability to attract good employment okay. or a good job when you yes. go to school. Yes. So they tell us that if you go to school, don't study so-called useless courses, mm -hmm. classics, archaeology, philosophy, mm -hmm. history. So they say if you study history, what are you going to do? If you study political science, you're going to be a politician. Mm -hmm. You should be studying engineering. You should mm -hmm. be studying law. Then you're going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Engineering, you're going to be an engineer. How was it in your days? And do you have an opinion about it right now? Because you engage with some young people. Who yes. Are there useless courses at the university? 
I find that very unfortunate because, you know, many years ago, um, Professor Jando, who was in the law faculty then, said to me, Phyllis, if I were you, I would do philosophy, literature, which I did, as well as even ancient history was one of my subjects in first year, FUE. At the university? Yes. He said, do that first and then do law. Lord Denning did that. One of the greatest luminaries in the legal field studied something else. I don't know what it was before he, I think he did classics, before he, 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 he studied law. Um, I am pleased that I did philosophy. I'm pleased that I'm, you know, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not the best you know, in the business, but I think it's given me a different perspective in the work I do currently. And so I would not discourage people who want to study the subjects that you mentioned. That's just archaeology. So when they, you, you apply to university and you're offered classics, religion, and Asian history, you shouldn't cry. At all. In fact, I think, especially when you're young, you know, there's, there's a lot ahead of you. And I think once you do that, it opens your mind. You're more exposed. You know, we talked about what you have in terms of consulting or what you have in terms of being a good politician, for example. Exposure is a key, you know, um, um, you component. By engaging with... Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I don't know about the British Parliament, but you ask how many of them didn't study the classics, you know, and it, it just puts you ahead, honestly, it does. That's what I think. And I find that people come into my company and they have what you're talking about, they have good, you know, they have strong degrees in economics, etc. And out of perhaps 10 people who have a degree in finance and economics, two, two of them are people I want to work with, <laughs> honestly. Because I find that the analytical um, um, quality is poor, you know, and as much as they have the degree, there's something missing. And so we send them downstairs to our institute to go and study what we call the Stellar Graduates Pro Professional Program, which is a competency upliftment program because you have to lift, we are telling people what to do as consultants. Our role is to tell people what to do. But if you can't start from base one, where you are more analytical than most people, then we can't work with you. But they have all the second uppers and the first class in economics. And I believe that if they understood more, you know, about how, you know, the, the thinking process works, they'll be better, yeah, or more exposed even, with breath of... Is it easy to run a, a Shobel firm for 14 years? Do you have any particular problems? <laughs> Your question is so funny because I don't know any private sector business that doesn't have any problems. I mean, but major ones. major ones, the major ones really are the staffing. I mean, we've trained, we've had so many people coming into the firm. Um, they've, I miss a lot of them, but I miss intensely very few of them because of that ability to, to do our work. So you're talking about the quality? The quality, market. maybe, yes. I think that's the bigger picture. Recently, as I told you, we had over a thousand applications for um, the, the uh, junior consulting positions, and we took them through a series of tests. Some of the people I, I wanted from the best schools didn't pass the first line. And so you wonder. So is it that the standards have fallen? Um, I think there's more for young people to choose from. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe that that has a lot to do with what's available now. Um, as we mentioned before, people can go into soccer. Um, social media is a major distraction in my view. Social media? Yes. It's a distraction? Yeah, because everybody's on WhatsApp and, and Twitter and um, FaceTime, mm. <laughs> not FaceTime, the other Facebook. one, Snapchat, and, yeah, all that. and you know, so um, then you call them back to their studies and like, oh, okay, you know, yes, I have to study as well. Um, I think it's good and bad in the sense that um, there's a lot available, more, a lot more avenues to study with um, and through in terms of research, etc. But that same animal is what also causes people not perhaps to concentrate, mm. okay? So I think that's one thing. I also think there's a lot of pressure on the educational system as it is, because more and more people are, are being educated, and that's great. Um, and, and because of that, perhaps, you know, the, the pace at which teachers are trained to, to tra teach them as well is, 
is faster and, and, and it's hard to catch up. And even equipment and resources in terms of recently there was in the BEC there was a report that one um, um, area didn't have computer um, skills training and yet they were having to take a computer exam. Mm -hmm. Those things point to the fact that there are just not enough resources to keep up with the pace of education and all that. And, and as I said, it's good, but we need to, to do more in terms of um, um, policy actions to, to, to step up the pace. Um, so your, your social media was the discourse. Which, which ones were your favorites? Um, I mean, by the time I, I grew up, there was Glenn's nightclub. Was it there when you were there? No, oh, Glenn's nightclub. Nobody went to Glenn's in my day. We went to KTK, Cave du Roi, and... Um, um, they were all in Accra? Gondola. Yeah, there was... Yeah, and so many other places. I mean, but there was a troika of, of, of nightclubs in Osu that we frequented. I mean, I went to a nightclub nearly every day. I only took Mondays off. Were you a bad girl then? I wasn't a bad girl, but I was a disco girl. Well, <laughs> you say you're a bad girl then if you... So as a university student, you went to discos every day? All the time. You didn't All the time. study? I couldn't study unless I went out. Oh, I see. So that's where I learned the yin and the yang. You need to be able to do both. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. you need to be able to, 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 to play hard and work hard, yes. Is it that you like music? I love music, but I mean, I can put music aside and study as well, yes. I feel it's all together. All of it has to come together to make you whole. So when you were in Cape Coast at Holy Child, what did you do? We had a pop course? group. Okay. We had, we, no, the, the whole idea is to have both mm. at all times. I see. Do we have <laughs> too many people in this country who don't have both and occupy positions and therefore their balance or imbalance affects mm. their output? No, oh, I think it depends on what your drive is. Mm. I mean, my drive is music and dancing and, you know, um, friendship, you know. Mm. Um, I'm, I don't spend as much time out as I would like to, but that's my drive. Other people art, other people enjoy art, other people enjoy going to church. That's their balance. I try to do all of that, the art, the church, the dancing and the work. Mm. <laughs> I see, that's interesting. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. You like to do all that. Yes. What, what excites you about this country's future? Oh, I think there's a lot. I mean, I'm concerned that I'm at the age at which you're going to grow old and you have to retire soon and you're not going to really be a part of it. I mean, what you can do is to write a book, perhaps, mm -hmm. because your knees won't hold up, etc. So I want to be um, alive enough to enjoy what I believe is coming. And I think there's a lot of opportunity coming. Um, um, there's a lot of things happening around the world which are not exactly um, um, comforting, but I believe that we in our own small way can do a lot to be part of the good change. And, and um, that includes learning a bit more, um, becoming more serious in some of the, 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 the things we do, and um, also teaching other people, because not everybody knows what they really have to do, you know. I mean. I mean, for instance, you have house help mm. and you think you've told them what to do, but you find that they actually don't know. You need to, to train them and make them understand um, what the difference is, for instance, I mean, between um, a saucer and a side plate, for example. Mm. I mean, you think that these things, are, oh, go and bring a saucer. So the person will bring um, 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 a bowl. A bowl. They don't <laughs> know, you know, but you are used to it, but mm. they are not. And that's life. I mean, you may know a lot, but not everybody does. And um, at work, in church, at school, there's a lot to learn. And it's not all about the classroom. You talk about church, and that interests me. And I, I know that you are at, uh, an avowed Catholic. Mm -hmm. But in your lifetime, you've seen the phenomenon of church also dramatically change in Ghana. Yes. Isn't it? How have yes. you related to that change? So I mean, I think you, you grew up with Orthodox, I believe, in the 60s and 70s. Yes. And then by the late 70s, the SUs that was in the schools yes. were now forming up in, in bigger ways. And yes. they were becoming um, meetings and fellowships. And by the time we were growing up, they were churches. You know, how, has that, how have you related to that change? First of all, I think it's, it's, the positive sides are great. Because in a way, they're life coaches as well, aren't they? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They teach people 
how to conduct themselves, etc. But there's a line that you must draw because then sometimes they go overboard and they start telling people prophecies and all that, which might not even be true mm. and misleading people. People are vulnerable and people are gullible. People want to believe what you tell them and um, especially when people are suffering. Mm. And so the idea is not to manipulate people. And that's where, I mean, even in the, um, in the, in the, con the conventional churches, you know, mm. that, that we all go to, you can find individuals who try to manipulate people. So that's a question of how you are able to judge and discern, mm. you know, where you must go and where you mustn't. And I think that requires people who help each other to understand, look, I know you're having problems, but where you're going, this and this and this So will you encourage your 20-year-old daughter to go to a charismatic church when there, you've raised her as a Catholic? There, there are charismatic, um, there's a charismatic movement in the Catholic church. I've been told, yes, yes these days. Yeah. Yes, um, but the long and short of it really is, first of all, you have to be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. What is it that really motivates you, okay, about religion? The second thing is, who is your, is your mentor? I mean, I've used the word mentor many times, but the whole society is in need of mentoring. Mm. As far as I'm, even I need a mentor. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are certain areas that you're completely lost as to how to you know, conduct yourself or what to do, etc. So I believe that mentoring is very important, even in terms of um, religion. You know, the young people need to find where to go. And so parents start by taking their children to the church and all that. And with time, they are influenced by more, perhaps, interesting churches, uh, etc. But the parent must explain what the difference is between what... And, and not to be condescending on where the child is going as well, because mm. perhaps it's more interesting. So maybe the parent should accompany the child and, and experience what it is the child has seen. And um, I think it's a question of... Um, who you're with and who you join. What about this superstar pastor phenomenon which began in America? I'm sure by the time you were growing up, O.R. Roberts was there, mm -hmm. but it suddenly came to Ghana. So you have superstar uh, pastors, Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, you have uh, Bishop Doug Ward Mills, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Manson Otterbill, Bishop Charles Ajinasari. These are key figures uh, that sometimes compete with politicians for space on the billboard. Well, as long as they are not deified, I mean, mm -hmm. they, are, they are key figures, but they are, are they gods? That's the thing. I mean, the idea is that these people are influencers, you know, mm -hmm. on society. And I think they do play a very significant role. It's a critical role that they play. The idea is for you to be able to discern which one makes you more confident that you're in the right place and it, 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 the question of judgment comes in the question of your own um, social circle and how they influence your decision and for you to look up to people who can help you take that decision as well because those people you speak about maybe the local ones are, are fine but you know some people I mean there was some individual in Grenada nowadays who gave everybody something to drink mm -hmm. and they all died in the commune and all that yeah. and they, they had ardent followers so the idea is to be sure that, and the state should also play a role. I mean, the state should start to, to, to be more involved in, you know, um, keeping these um, churches, as you call them, and everything on the straight and narrow. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's, only, it's not only about the straight, straight and narrow in the Bible. It's the straight and narrow in, 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 in being, you know, compliant with, with legal prescriptions and, and everybody is supposed to comply with the law and there should be order. Should I know be you, order. Don't, you don't like to talk about politics but you are a granddaughter of Pa Grant, um, one of the famous uh, mm -hmm. supporters and financiers of Ghana's early political movement. Yes. That's your grandfather. Yes. Uh, how do you see Ghana politics? In November we will vote again. I say whichever party wins, Ghana can only get better, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm the eternal optimist because um, I think if this current government wins, they'll have learnt a lot of lessons. If the new, if, if, um, the new patriotic party wins, um, I'm sure there are certain things that have happened in the past that they will not want to repeat, okay? So either way, I think Ghana wins. Um, the idea is for us 
as opinion leaders, people who are um, in government or out of government in the private sector to help to shape <laughs> the, the, the country in the direction that we want it. Okay, and I think we can do that in different ways. Um, professionally, sorry, um, through our sharing our opinion and in, in, in the ways in which government itself has opened up for public discourse, uh, the media, etc. We should be able to help to shape whichever government council. I'll go back to the issue which I raised earlier, which is that I am positive that whichever government comes into power would have learned some lessons. And we are going to hold them to account, yes. What disappoints you about this country and its future? Um, I'd like to think that everybody has integrity. <laughs> That's one of my, my key things um, in terms of where I'd like us to be. The first of all, we should all have integrity. Um, in a poor country, it's, it's, you'll be faced with all sorts of things and you must take decisions. I would like to be in a position where I can say hand on heart that my government, the people I work with, the people I know, um, the people in power have integrity and, and do what they must do in order to keep the country going, not necessarily for themselves. So that's for me is the first thing. So with all your expertise, um, now politics is up. Uh, you can be part of this election because the ticket is done. But if in future someone were to invite you to be his running mate in one of the major parties, to be vice president of Ghana, which I think you're more than qualified for, is this something you would do? I'm not given to politics, unfortunately, um, but I'm given to supporting, um, supporting people to do their work well. And um, so I'm not sure that I would be happy to be <laughs> a, a running mate necessarily, because you have to get involved in the politics. And I, I don't have an answer to that question, <laughs> frankly. But do you vote? I vote, yes, I vote, I, I vote. Uh, I so vote. You, you get partisan in the, in the ballot box? We all have to. Yeah. Yeah, we all have to. But um, I don't think I'm a platform person. That's, that's yeah. the problem, yes. I mean, so what's your favorite entertainment spot in Ghana these days? <laughs> they say you like Plus 233. I do. I do. I like. I haven't been there in a while because mm -hmm. of the work and all that, yes. But I do enjoy going to Plus 233, yeah. Where else do you go that you like? Um, these days I don't go out very much. Mm. Um, recently I went to Scots. Plot seven, which was nice. Um, yeah. Uh, Chester had his birthday party. That was lovely. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Yes. Okay. I okay. like going out when I have the time. Mm. Yes. And sometimes your... we have a drink after work in the office too. I see in the office. Time. Oh yeah, you, we have parties. You jam in the office. <laughs> we we try to occasionally just to <laughs> because there's a lot of pressure. We don't yeah. go home. We, we are there till two a.m., three a.m. Yeah. So occasionally we have a, a you know a nice glass of wine and. I see. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite local radio program, something like that? The Jazz on Joy. I like Kennedy's. Kennedy, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, entertainment on, what do, you, what do you think of Ghanaian movies, Nigerian movies? Do you, have you seen them? No, I don't watch them, unfortunately. I don't. Oh, you don't like them? Well, I think we have a long way to go there. So I, I, and I don't have much time. So mm. when I'm free, I'd like to either sleep or entertain you know i have people visiting now and then i don't have that many visitors even you know because i'm hardly at home frankly. i see mm -hmm. there's one phenomenon political phenomenon as in it may be that sort of punctuated um the life of you and people of your generation is flight lieutenant rawlins mm -hmm. what do you think about him um what do i think about him those days I had a lot of issues with the coup mm -hmm. because we were in law school, we were just about to finish and, yeah. and I wish that we had, I had graduated in a democratic dispensation, for example. So I had a lot of issues. But I have a lot of friends in, in, in the PNDC, you know, um, Mr. Chikata, um, Dr. Botre, they were all my friends mm -hmm. and um, the Ahoys. So I enjoyed them as well. Um, so. Flight left on Rawlings, I think he tried to do his best, um, but I left. I left Ghana in 19... Um, when was it, I guess? 83 or so, according 1983, to 1983, yes. So he, he drove I you just, out? 
He did. I have to say that the, no, it wasn't him. The, but the the coup and the situation drove me out because I really wanted to to do what I could in terms of what I had studied. And no, no, I, I felt that I didn't have that free. Um, so, so you, you don't that. like Rollins? I think everybody grows up, and I think he's grown up too. And um, I think he's probably learned a, a few lessons, as we, indeed we all have. And he's probably a better person than he was then. But it's not like he didn't do a good job those days. I think he tried. Okay, it's just that the context was not favorable for me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't. So I, I just leave. had to leave. Yes, mm -hmm. I had to leave. I had to leave. Apart from your, your children, who's your best friend? I have good friends. I mean, I have. I went to Holy Child, as I said. One of my good friends is Patricia Boots. You know, she's Mrs. Boots. She used to be Patricia Adai and her mm -hmm. sister Helena. Mm -hmm. And then I have one from Wesley Girls, mind you. Uh -huh. um, her name is Barbara. Justice Barbara Kayunsi is my very good friend. And her friends as well, you know, Wilhelmina and Sa, etc. They all, you know, we hang out occasionally. Yes, yes. Mm. So when is the next hangout? I'd like to come. Currently, we have a few um, bereavements, and so um, we're commiserating. You know, okay. we have Mrs. Ruth Bozio. Yeah. She's she's our mother and our, our, our big matriarch. She passed, and her very best friend and my aunt as well has just passed in the U.S. So I may or may not go, um, but. We are, after we are that. commiserating. Mm. After that, we're back. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. It is said that women who are unmarried, like you, do better mm -hmm. than women who are married. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you would have achieved all that you've achieved if you were a fully married woman? That's a good question. Because I think I had the freedom to relate because I wasn't married. I mean, I can relate to anyone and nobody's at home saying to me, why are you talking to that gentleman? Why are you late coming home from work? Yes, to that extent it's true. But I do have responsibilities as any married woman or mother would because I brought up my own, uh, the twins. Um, I, my mother is 91 and she lives with me and every morning when I'm leaving for the office, I have a lot of issues leaving her alone, you know, and so I take care of her, I take care of the broader family and um, I, I always tell the people in my office, you know, you're going home to family, but I have a family as well, mm. you know. But to that extent, yes, I don't have someone who says, why are you not home? Why haven't you cooked for me and all that? And that may or may not have helped because I, I know a lot of women who are married who have done very, very well, even better, you know, who, who are doing a lot better than I am in terms of working and growing their, their businesses and all that. And I really admire them. I have mentors too, people I look up to, you know. So I think, uh, and they're married. Mm, I see. Okay. <laughs> Super. So, yes. Thank you, Phyllis. It's a pleasure. Yes, Thank yes, you so yes, much. Yes. That is Phyllis Meyer Christian, the founder of Shawbell Consulting. Mm -hmm.